Hello and welcome to your number one tech show. This is Take On Tech and today we have a packed up show for you. We continue with our conversation around cyber hygiene, which Grace Kivaga will be tackling later on in Tech Talk. But for you to remember, is the hashtag take on tech at KBC channel one. This is where you can converse with us. My name is Stephanie Ayeta. In your take today, we'd like to know some of the recommendations you'd give in helping promote cyber hygiene to the marginalized communities. Talk to us. The hashtag to use is take on tech at KBC Channel 1. In tech news, we let you in on the details of the registration exercise by the data controllers and processors as announced by the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. And internationally... UK is said to have the biggest automated drone superhighway. This and much more in our Tech News Roundup. The Office of the Data Protection Commissioner announced the commencement of the registration exercise for data controllers and processors. Registration charges are dependent on the category within which the data controller or data processor falls. The regulations classifies private data controllers and processors into three classes for the purpose of the exercise. These are micro and small data controllers and processors. They are those with an annual revenue of 5 million Kenyan shillings and have 1 to 50 employees. They are required to pay a fee of 2,000 Kenyan shillings. The second is medium data controllers and processors. These are companies with an annual revenue of above 5 million Kenyan shillings but less than 50 million Kenyan shillings with 51 to 99 employees. They are required to pay a fee of 9,000 Kenyan shillings. The third are the large data controllers and processors. These are those with an annual revenue of more than 50 million Kenyan shillings and more than 99 employees. They are required to pay a fee of 25,000 Kenyan shillings. Public and non-profit making entities such as charities and religious entities are also required to register. The fee of both entities is 2,000 Kenyan shillings. A data controller determines the purpose or function for which and means by which personal data is processed. Examples of data controllers are telcos, hospitals, and loan vendors. A data processor, on the other hand, processes data on behalf of the data controller. A processor often is a third party external to the data controller. An example of a data processor is a firm offering IT solutions such as cloud storage. This registration exercise is per stipulation stated in the Data Protection Act 2019 and Data Protection Regulations 2021. The United Kingdom is set to become home to the world's largest automated drone superhighway within the next two years. The drones will be used on the 164-mile Skyway project connecting towns and cities, including Cambridge and Rugby. It is part of a £273 million funding package for the aerospace sector. Other projects include drones delivering mail to the Isles of Sicily and medication across Scotland. BT is a British multinational telecommunication holding company, one of the partners involved in the collaboration. Skyway aims to connect the airspace above Reading, Oxford, Milton Keynes, Cambridge, Coventry and Rugby by mid-2024 and will receive more than £12 million. A total of £105.5 million of the government's funding will be specifically for the projects relating to integrating aviation systems and new vehicle technologies, including unmanned aerial vehicles such as drones. These projects include a plan to use drones to provide regular deliveries of mail and medicines to the Isles of Sealy and to distribute medicines 
citizens across Scotland, potentially enabling some cancer patients to be treated in their local community. The technology utilizes ground-based sensors installed along the highway which provide a real-time view of where the drones are in the airspace. Steve Wright, an associate professor in aerospace engineering at UWE Bristol, said the biggest concern regarding crashes does not come when the drone is in the air, but during takeoff or landing. Mr. Pankhurst said the project was working alongside Civil Aviation Authority to ensure safety. In today's Take of the Week feature, we tell you of a technology that is there to help you keep warm and comfortable while driving your car, especially in the cold weather. I'm talking about the heated car seat. Let's take a look. Heated car seat covers are practical accessories that protect your car seat and make them more comfortable, especially for someone who lives in a place that is mostly cold. A heated car seat provides heat when turned on. It helps protect the surfaces of the seats from spills and keeps one warm while on the move. Features that most heated car seat covers have include automatic shut-off, adjustable temperature settings, indicator light, programmable timer, and massage capabilities. Using a heated car seat cover can have many benefits such as providing comfort, seat and interior protection, muscle relaxation, and lumbar support. But do these seats lead to more gas consumption? A vehicle's heating system uses heat already created by the engine and sends it to the interior for warmth. Other features like heated seats, stereo system, and windshield wipers also run on electricity courtesy of your vehicle's alternator. The alternator is powered by creating more resistance on the engine. It requires more gas usage and taps into your vehicle vehicle's fuel efficiency. But keep in mind that the drag on your fuel economy is minimal. This is because all vehicles have lower fuel economy in cold temperatures versus warmer days. There isn't a lot of research on the negative impact of heated automotive seats on the environment. Though heated seats don't use much energy, those in combustion engine vehicles contribute to fossil fuel use, which is bad for the environment. Car companies such as BMW are now offering British drivers the option of enjoying a heated seat on a monthly subscription basis. The heated coils and other hardware required to actually heat the seats are already in the car, but the owners can if they wish, pay a monthly fee to BMW which will allow them to actually work. Naturally, if the driver who opts into the program doesn't make their payment, then the company will turn off the heated seats. With that, let's now move on to Tech Talk, where Grace Gizaiger has been joined by Mwendwa Kivuva, who's a cyber hygiene trainer, and they are there to delve into today's topic, which we have also invited your participation in, how to bring cyber hygiene to the marginalized communities. Let's listen in. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for that introduction. You're watching the interview section of Take on Tech, a weekly program that brings you technological concepts and debates and breaks down technological in an antique way. Now, last time we had a guest who spoke about cyber hygiene and we are having a campaign around cyber hygiene because most of the talks have actually been on cyber security. So what really is cyber hygiene? In today's interview section, we are going to, to talk about bringing cyber hygiene to the ordinary and marginalized uh, populations. And in the studio, our guest is Mwendo Kivuva. Uh, Kivuva is a techie and a trainer in cyber hygiene. 
Karibu sana to the program. Kibuba. Thank you so much, Grace. Okay. So we'll just go straight uh, again. In a, in, in, in a way that uh, you have been training the marginalized, please break it down for us. What is cyber hygiene? So this is a very important question. And we, we know that technology now is being used by everybody. Even if you go to the grassroots, the ordinary Mwananchi is using technology. And there are so many challenges that they face. So the same way that we are taught if you want to have probably a good gut, a good tummy, you have to wash your hands, you have to sanitize your equipment, you have to boil your water so that you can be healthy. Even when you are using IT tools, this can be the internet, phones, devices, computers. There are some precautions that you need to make or some cleaning, some form of hygiene so that you can be safe and secure within that space. For example, how to use strong passwords on your devices. If you are using a phone, how to use strong pins, for example, and make sure that your phone is not always open. It has a pin so that if somebody gets access to your phone, they are not able to get your data because they will be asked for something to get into it. So in simple terms is actually how to secure yourself online and also the devices that you use. Okay, including the phone. Including the phone, yeah. Okay. Including emails, including your images, WhatsApps, and all that, how to secure them. All right. Yeah. Uh, now, before we come to that uh, question of how to secure them, you have been working with marginalized uh, populations. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about that? So, uh, who are these populations? Yeah, so this, this cyber hygiene campaign is targeted on marginalized populations. And these marginalized populations can be people living in informal settlements, people living in the outskirts of the big cities, it can be farmers, it can be people Li living with disabilities, PWDs, because they have their own special challenges that we will talk about. And it can be youth and women and even old people who, who have not been socialized into using devices early enough as our kids have. So this population, you will find them all over the country. They are new users to devices, but they don't know the challenges that are posed on when, you are, when the challenges that they get when they use these devices. For example, you will go to a bank and the bank will probably give you a phone and tell you in this phone you can be able to transfer money. And if you don't know how to do that, you will go and give a relative or a friend to assist you to do that transaction. Or if you are given a P, uh, an ATM card by the bank and you don't know how to use it, you'll go and look for assistance somewhere. And you see that, that poses challenges because you are now uh, subjecting yourself into risks. Because if somebody is assisting you to transact money, it means that they can uh, divert those funds maybe to themselves or somewhere else. That's why this training is very important, especially for the marginalized and the less educated and also people with disabilities. Tech on Tech needs to take a short break mm -hmm. and when we come back we will pick it from there. We'll okay. still continue with the challenges. Uh, tech on Tech takes a short break. Uh, today we are discussing taking cyber hygiene to the marginalized uh, communities with Mwendoa Kivuva. Please continue following us on our social media handles and that's at KBC Channel 1 across all the platforms. <music> You're watching the interview section of Tech on Tech, a weekly program that brings you technological concepts and debates. 
and breaks them down in an Anteku way. And in today's uh, interview section, we are talking about bringing cyber hygiene to the people with Mwendoa Kivuva, who is a techie and a trainer in cyber hygiene. Now, Kivuva, just before we went on break, you were just giving us uh, some of these challenges that, um, that uh, you know, the marginalized communities experience mm -hmm. while interacting with the, with the internet, with the online platforms. Mm -hmm. Please take it from there, where we were. Okay. So, uh, we have talked about several of the challenges that they are facing. So, we continue the challenges or we go to the solutions? Just continue the challenges. Okay. At least the most common ones. Yeah. So, you find that people go to, most people want to access services, like even if it's tax services or emails, they go to and use common computers or computers that are shared with other people. The common example is, is a cyber cafe. So you go to a cyber cafe and you, you open your, the browser. platform you are using, yeah, the browser and then you open the platform you are using. The platform can be a social media website, can be a blanking, banking platform, can be a government service. And then you, when you log in, there is usually a pop-up that comes in, do you want to save your password? So how many people click save the password? So you go to that common computer, you find that so many people have saved their password on a common computer that is accessible by hundreds of people. You see, that is one very big challenge that uh, people face. And you find that sometimes even if you don't save, you, you after you use that platform, how many people know how to log out of that platform? So if it's a social media platform on a common shared computer, you find that you have left it open. So it's like you have your door in a market, your shop in a marketplace, you have left it open. So anybody can get in. So when you are going home, you have left a common, that laptop open. So people can access, if it was a tax uh, service you are accessing, they can access your details. If it was an email service you are accessing, people can access your details. If it was social media, people can access your details. So that's very common. Another common example we see is this thing called like sim, sim swapping for example and why do they do sim swapping so that they can be able to take your identity so that's like identity theft uh, how, how this happens is they go to a service uh, an agent of a service provider who have been given blank sim cards and they pretend to be you so that they take your identity and when they take that identity from you it means that uh, when they have a SIM card like you, all the services you used to have on your phone, now they, ha they have them on, your, on their phone. This can be mobile money, for example, M-Pesa, T-Cash, and the rest. Uh, it means they can borrow loans because people will borrow so much loans using their devices. So they can, you will find that between all the different lending platforms, if people have like five of them. So you find that p money has been borrowed in your account that you are not aware of. So the, the next time you go to borrow a legit loan, you go to a, the credit reference bureau, they tell you, oh, you have borrowed from this, 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 and this platform. And you are not even aware about okay, that. Okay, now, mm. how do people then secure themselves from all this? Because you are talking to people who may be innocent, yeah. who, you know, like you have said, they have weak passwords, mm -hmm. like the names of their their babies or their mm. husbands or mm. their date of birth. H how do people navigate uh, through this maze that is the mm. online? Uh, yeah, so there are, there are many ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are many ways of securing yourself online. And as you have seen the challenges I'm, I'm putting across, you can actually even just think about uh, the solutions you can give. So for yeah. example, if you are using... Yeah. In fact, mm. talk about PWDs. Okay. Yeah, because I think uh, there is a challenge there that probably people need to understand. Yeah, so for PWDs, that challenge is special because uh, for we said most of them you find they need a caregiver or uh, an assistant to help them. So we advise if, if somebody is a PWD to only stick with one assistant. One assistant who is able to... Trusted. Trusted, reliable, and probably always available. This is all not always the case. So if, if it is not available, maybe you can go to two, but don't go to three, four, up to ten. But PWD's challenges are many. And one, one thing that can be done is for platforms, companies, and 
organizations and governments that are creating platforms for other people to also have a different worldview, to also involve the people within the PWD space so that they can be able to develop uh, platforms and solutions that also does, do not only cater for the people with, with all abilities, but also the people who are abled differently. Okay. Yeah. Now, so thank you so much for gracing the interview section of Tech on Tech. Uh, I think uh, we'll still continue with this conversation of cyber hygiene uh, because of the, of course, uh, all these scams that you know people experience, SIM swap, mm -hmm. and uh, what have you. So thank you so much. Uh, that brings us to the end of the interview section of Tech on Tech. We were talking about bringing cyber hygiene to the marginalized communities. Uh, please continue following us on our social media handles, and that's at KBC Channel One across all platforms. My name is Grace Gidaiga. Keep watching. We have gotten to the Innovators Club. This is the segment where we bring you great minds, great innovations and inventions. And apart from that, we challenge you to think outside the box and try something new. And that is why today we have a do-it-yourself hack which you can do at home with minimal resources. Check it out. This is an airbag for urban cyclists. It is worn like a collar around the neck. Hobding 3 registers the cyclist's movements 200 times per second. In the event of an accident, the airbag inside the collar inflates in 0.1 seconds. Hobding says that this will efficiently fixate the neck and protect the head from injury. The activation system is a magnetic solution that puts the Hobding in active mode when the strap is inserted. When inserted, a magnetic field is broken which activates the Hobding. The airbag is designed like a hood and made in a one-piece woven polyamide that won't rip when scraped against the ground. The collar is made of waterproof, functional fabric that provides the best possible protection for the built-in airbag system. The size can be adjusted by using the BOA solution. The BOA is attached to the collar at the outer inside facing neck center. The collar is ergonomically designed with even weight distribution across the shoulders. It is slightly heavier at the back than at the front, so that when cycling, the weight is resting on your back. The collar isn't washable, but is protected from wear, sweat and dirt by the surrounding fabric shell. Any marks on the collar can be rubbed off carefully with a damp cloth. Hobding is charged with a USB cable. Battery level is easy to check by using the function button on the collar. Two hours of charging makes the battery last for 15 hours of active cycling. The device is Bluetooth connected and notifies selected contacts in the event of an accident. Hobding mentions that, according to scientific research, their airbag technology protects up to eight times better than traditional bicycle helmets. Hovding's accident detection system consists of an algorithm based on artificial intelligence. This algorithm is trained by providing it with data. Hovding says that thousands of tests were done, reenacting cycling accidents using stunt riders and crash test dummies to collect the specific movement patterns of cyclists in accidents. This data creates a solid base for Hovding's accident detection algorithm. Cycling may be the answer to many of the challenges relating to the environment, congestion in cities, and health. Hovding certainly takes cyclist protection to the next level. to today's show but as you know the conversation never stops today's question we are asking you 
what are some of the recommendations that you would give to help promote cyber hygiene to the marginalized communities? The hashtag to use is Tech on Tech at KBC Channel 1. You can also interact with me at Stephanie underscore Ayeta across all social media platforms. And we meet next week, same time, same place. Until then, let's keep it tech. Adios.